So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sierra Nevada Alliance's May webinar. My name is Jennifer Marshall, and I'm the Alliance's Development and Community Engagement Director. And I'm so happy that all of you could make it here this afternoon. A uh, very popular topic we have, um, super relevant to the work that we're doing here in the Sierra. And I am pleased to introduce our three panelists today. We have Andy Sawyer, the Assistant Chief Counsel with California Water Resources Control Board. Alex Loomer, Environmental Attorney with and Water and Climate Policy Consultant. And then Sam Davidson, Senior Policy Analyst with Trout Unlimited. So as part of the Alliance's effort to revamp watershed coordination efforts in the Sierra Nevada, we bring these experts to you. And so Andy will cover various topics, including recent developments in California water rights management. And Alex and Sam will talk about the role of fresh water in achieving the state's 30 by 30 conservation goals. And they'll also provide an update on water issues in California's legislative session. So during the presentation, if you have any questions, you can add them directly to the chat and we'll have about 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers. So uh, we'll monitor all of that for you and you'll get a chance, um, they'll get a chance to respond to your questions at the end. So I am going to turn it over um, to Andy right now. Thank you. Um, the Sierra Nevada are not an uh, independent state either politically or hydrologically. So what's new in the Sierra is really a consequence of what's new downstream in the watersheds uh, and statewide. Um, as for what's new uh, in an area as steeped in tradition and history as water law is, uh, to me, new means uh, anything since 1967. But I, uh, we'll try to focus on the more recent period because there has been a lot of recent developments uh, in the last decade. 2014, we saw the enactment of two major pieces of legislation that would have been thought to have been politically infeasible, were thought to be politically infeasible, uh, as recently as 2013. Uh, those were the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. The photo here shows Governor Brown signing the bills. Uh, and the transfer of the state's drinking water program to the State Water Resources Control Board, which has in turn helped facilitate efforts to focus on dealing with the problems of uh, inadequate water supplies, unsafe water supplies uh, for disadvantaged communities. Uh, there were three developments that made these enactments possible. One was the increased uh, influence of tribes. Uh, the support of tribes was critical to the enactment of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. A second was the rise and influence of environmental justice groups uh, whose support was critical to both of these uh, enactments. Uh, but the major factor that changed the politics and made in these enactments possible was the drought, uh, or that portion of the drought that occurred between about 2012 and 2016. Uh, it made it untenable to do nothing about groundwater management as wells were, were lost their water supply from declining water supplies through having declining water levels. And um, that in turn highlighted the need for safe and affordable drinking water uh, for disadvantaged communities uh, and led to the enactment of both uh, major enactments and led to uh, several other important developments. As you know, the uh, drought resulted in a very little, very steep decline in the amount of water uh, in the Sierra snowpack, uh, 
Um, and at the time, people weren't emphasizing just how severe the drought was. If you look just at the amount of precipitation, the drought was consistent with some of the worst droughts we've had in the last 150 years. Uh, but if you look at both the amount of precipitation and the temperature, uh, this was a much more severe drought, the worst effect on the snowpack in 500 years. Uh, and in terms of other uh, impacts like the uh, bark beetle infestation that led to the loss of about 130 million mature trees in the Sierra, probably the worst drought uh, since the medieval mega droughts. Uh, the drought, the rainfall was less and over a longer period in those areas, but combined with the hotter temperatures we're seeing from climate change, um, the overall effect of the drought uh, was more severe than we had ever seen. That led to a number of uh, responses, including additional legislation, some of which was included in uh, budget trailer bills, uh, which we'll hear about later, and some of which was originally proposed by the administration budget trailer bills, but was later enacted in other enactments like the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, one of those budget trailer bill provisions was included in Senate Bill 88 in 2015, which set requirements for uh, measurement and, record and reporting of water diversion and use. That's very important because uh, it's often said you can't manage what you don't measure. Well, we weren't measuring our diversions for many diversions. We didn't have accurate and up-to-date information. I would editorialize that that's the reason uh, we didn't have good measurement authority is people figured if they don't have the information, they can't manage it and we don't want to, them to be managed. But the water supply shortage in the, in the delta in the drought highlighted the need for better management, led to the enactment of SB 88, which authorized the State Water Board to adopt regulations, which have been adopted to uh, require uh, measurement and reporting with more frequent and more uh, accurate measurement for the largest diversions uh, to help provide the information to better manage our, our waters. Uh, in addition, later budget amendments have um, supported what we call our upward program, where we're updating the water rights database. Uh, currently, uh, the, most of the information is in paper files and uh, old maps on the second floor of the building from which I speak um, and not easily accessible by the public uh, or uh, water agencies and, and ourselves, we're, we're trying to get better collection of data uh, and get it in a digitized system uh, that will be both more transparent um, and provide the basis for uh, improved water right management. Um, an additional step, of course, will need to be getting a better grip on what the water rights are. Uh, as I think most of you know, we have a permit and license system for administration of water rights, uh, water appropriations initiated after December 19th, 1914, uh, but that does not cover what are called pre-1914 rights, the prior appropriations, uh, or riparian rights, which are tied to uh, the lands adjacent to uh, the, the river or stream from which they're diverted. The Planning and Conservation League sponsored a group of water rights experts, um, including the late Clifford Lee, who's shown in this photo, uh, who came up with a series of recommendations, uh, one of which is Senate Bill 389, uh, which would authorize the State Water Resources Control Board to determine on a case-by-case -case basis, water right by water right basis, what are the actual water rights for people uh, uh, claiming uh, pre-1914 appropriative 
or uh, riparian water rights. That's one of the problems in managing during shortage is um, we have a water right priority system that is intended to determine who has the right who has rights to water when there isn't enough to cover everybody's water rights but that doesn't work if you don't actually know what people's water rights are uh, so this bill is an effort to better determine what the rights are uh, so they can be properly administered other things that happen in response to the drought is the governor issued a series of emergency proclamations and uh, executive orders uh, directing agencies, especially the State Water Sources Control Board, to take uh, appropriate action in response to the drought. Uh, and uh, also, the governor has the authority in the Emergency uh, Services Act uh, to suspend statutes. So the governor suspended some statutes, including procedural requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, so things could be done immediately in response to the drought. Uh, one of the things he did is he directed the State Water Service Control Board to adopt restrictions on urban water use to uh, reduce water use by 25%. Uh, the State Water Services Control Board uh, adopted those regulations, uh, and they achieved something very close to the intended 25% uh, reduction. The amount of water saved by the drought water conservation uh, and done over a very brief period exceeds all the additional water that would be made available by all the proposed water projects uh, now being proposed for, for funding to um, divert and store uh, more water. Uh, conserve and this is just urban use that would save that much when urban use is only about 20% uh, of the overall water use in the state. Uh, and the governor also directed the State Water Service Control Board to adopt emergency regulations to curtail diversions uh, consistent with the available supply so that when there's only enough water available for the most senior water rights, um, the regulations would uh, assure that only the most senior water rights were diverted and others were not, in effect, uh, stealing their water. Uh, the state water sources adopted those regulations uh, for select streams where the state board determined it was most important to do that. Uh, those regulations set minimum in-stream flows, uh, and then to the extent there's not enough water to, uh, with everybody diverting what they claim is their right, uh, to protect those minimum in-stream flows, uh, the board will issue curtailments based on water priority, white priority uh, to restrict those diversions as necessary to protect those minimum in-stream flows. Um, emphasis on the word minimum, we sometimes call those belly scraping flows. There were the bare minimum to let the fish survive uh, over the uh, drought period in the hopes that they could uh, recover later. Uh, those uh, flows were um, ultimately adopted for the Deer Creek. Uh, there, they actually led to settlements on uh, Mill and Antelope Creek. Those three creeks um, are tributary to the Sacramento River. They run somewhat northeast to southwest uh, just uh, west of Lake Almanor. Uh, so technically on a watershed basis, they're far southern Cascades, although they are just to the west uh, of the Sierra. Uh, those were challenged in court uh, based on the argument you could, you, that water rights have to be done case by case. You can't act by regulation, uh, alleged violations of due process, alleged takings of water rights. Uh, for curtailing diversions uh, to protect the minimum stream flows, in this case needed for spring run Chinook salmon. Uh, those uh, claims were all rejected in a court of appeal case uh, called Stanford Vina, the California Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court denied review. 
Uh, for the delta and watersheds tributary to the delta, the water board adopted what might be characterized as a softer approach. Uh, no minimum requirements for in-stream flow were set in the regulation. The water board issued notice of availability to let people know when in our calculations there was insufficient water available under their priority of right and they needed to curtail. Um, and then took enforcement action against those who didn't curtail. Uh, the enforcement action was based on Section 1052 of the Water Code, which basically authorizes enforcement against unauthorized diversion or use of water. Uh, courts had previously rejected arguments that if you claim a pre-14 water right, we can't bring enforcement for unauthorized diversion, saying, well, the Water Board has authority to uh, determine whether you have the right you claim or because otherwise it's an uh, unauthorized diversion. Um, but somewhat and surprisingly to us, the court interpreted it to say, well, if the reason your diversion is unauthorized is because there's not enough water available, uh, then the water board lacks enforcement authority. Um, it distinguished Stanford Vina, which was decided earlier, which said it would be different if you had adopted regulations first and enforced those regulations. But going straight to enforcement, uh, as the Water Board did here, the court said uh, was unauthorized. Uh, there is legislation pending authored by Assemblymember Buffy Wicks uh, that would overrule Stanford Vina. Uh, but in the meantime, we had concluded anyway that the approach followed it, uh, excuse me, it would, the Buffy Wicks bill would overrule the California water curtailment cases and, and in practical effect reaffirm the Stanford Vina case. Um, we had already decided the, in the future the better way to go is adopt regulations first um, and implement the regulations rather than going straight to enforcement uh, without any protection of in-stream flow as we had done in the California water curtailment cases. Um, the next drought, or if you like, the next part of the drought uh, came back before we could even complete our evaluation of what worked and didn't work uh, in the uh, 2013 to 2016 uh, drought. Um, the again a very low snowpack um, we again executive orders were issued calling on us to do curtailments um, we did complete a review which we call the warder report of um, uh, how effective we had been in the in the previous drought um, uh, and adopted similar measures to what we had adopted in the previous years uh, in response to the drought uh, we adopted uh, a regulation this time for curtailments in the Delta watershed, which of course most of the Sierras in the Delta watershed or most of the west slope of the Sierra. Uh, curtailment regulations on the Russian River, uh, Mill and Deer Creek, the, again the Spring Run Chinook Salmon uh, Creeks um, in the northern Sacramento Valley. Uh, and uh, in the Shasta and Scott Rivers, which provide important habitat um, for coho uh, salmon. Um, as I said, this time all of the curtailments uh, were uh, done pursuant to uh, regulations um, instead of going to trying to enforce against in the unauthorized diversion. Uh, authority. Um, uh, and most of them, except the Delta watershed ones, included minimum in-stream flows to protect the fishery and then curtailed as necessary to uh, protect those minimum in-stream flows. Uh, one of the consequences of, of the drought is, is that uh, Mono Lake has been in decline. Uh, this is a problem we thought we had solved. In 1994, the State Water Service Control Board adopted Decision 1631, which set requirements as to how much the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power could divert from the tributaries to Mono Lake uh, based on the 
the um, height of Mono Lake, so that as if it got closer to the critical levels at which uh, the islands that uh, provide important rookeries could be would be peninsulas, uh, they were reduced to zero in the amount they could divert. Whereas it came closer to the or above the target level of 6,392 feet above sea level, they could divert higher amounts. Um, it, it should have been self-correcting, and we thought so at the time, but with so many periods of extended drought, and as I said, higher heat than we've seen in previous droughts, uh, we've seen declining levels uh, over, over the, more, the more recent droughts, and we've held a workshop to see hear testimony on what kind of adjustments may be necessary to protect Mono Lake. Another development that's going on is to, in response to earlier trends is our issues concerning water quality certification for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that's I'll call them FERC, uh, licensed hydro projects in California. Um, there's a great deal of federal preemption in this area so that the uh, water quality conditions that apply to uh, Hydroelectric projects are largely determined by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license. These licenses are in effect for 40 to 50 years. The state's primary control is water quality certification under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. The um, federal permit or license needs a state water quality certification. Uh, if the state denies certification, the license can be issued, can't be issued. If it conditions the certification, the conditions become part of the federal license. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a super veto. But if the state fails to act within a year of the request for certification, the state waives authority. We, many of the projects up for relicensing at this period were first developed before modern environmental laws and before Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. So the relicensing has been a pro provided an opportunity for the first time to adequately address in-stream flows, fish passages, and other matters concerning uh, hydropower operations. Uh, we've been using that authority, but had a major setback in, 19, in 2019, where the DC Circuit, based on the circumstances of that case, set a written agreement to put the water quality certification on hold indefinitely while the applicant withdrew and resubmitted its request every year amounted to a waiver. Previously, FERC had held if, if the application is withdrawn and resubmitted, the start clock stops over. FERC really has never been much interested in either water quality or state authority. They jumped on it and took it to be every time an applicant uh, withdraws and resubmits its request for certification, uh, that constitutes a waiver, um, even if the only thing the state did uh, was uh, notify the applicant when the deadline came up and it would be denied if they didn't withdrawal. Uh, that resulted in FERC, uh, well, I should go back, uh, the Modesto and Turlock Irrigation Districts, which have uh, Don Pedro and the Grange Dams up for licensing or relicensing said, well, withdraw and resubmit really has the same effect as denial, because if somebody denies, you can also reapply. So if the state denies certification, that should also be treated as a waiver. Um, that was too far even for FERC. The, the statute says the license can't be issued if certification is denied. They sued in the District of Columbia Circuit, uh, who, who upheld the decision that no means no. Uh, then they sought Supreme Court review. And then just about a month ago, the Supreme Court uh, denied their request for review. Uh, several other cases where there had been a withdrawal and resubmit because um, the California Environmental Quality Act document had not been completed. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission did say that constitutes a waiver when it's withdrawn and resubmit. The State Water Resources Control Board sued. The Ninth Circuit upheld the State Water Resources Control Board's position. So we retain our certification authority in those cases. And about a week ago, the United States Supreme Court uh, denied review. 
there's legislation going on with respect to this. Senator Caballero had a legislation in the state legislature that was intended to very narrowly take away the, or very narrowly limit the state water service control board authority, prohibiting us from denying certification or dealing with flow issues. It was later amended to be able with just to just set strict timelines, but that, even that failed to get out of the Senate Appropriations Committee. The bill is dead. There are still, however, bills in the in the, in Congress to restrict state certification. Uh, that has more to do with concerns from oil and gas industry that certification is preventing polluting natural gas and coal facilities. Uh, but the legislation is also, in some some of the legislation is also aimed at water quality certification of hydropower. Um, one of the big issues, especially in the Turlock and and uh, Nevada Irrigation District and the other certifications I talked about, is the certifications uh, include conditions to implement the water quality control plan for the the Bay Delta uh, in this for the South Delta, the tributaries to the San Joaquin River, the State Water Resources Control Board uh, adopted requirements to maintain a percentage of uh, unimpaired flows, uh, which will require increased bypass or release from the rim dams. Uh, and that in turn may require changes uh, in uh, upstream diversions that are of junior priority to maintain those in-stream flows, uh, where that we included conditions to do so in the certification and are beginning efforts to uh, proceed with full implementation of those uh, 28, uh, those uh, 19, uh, 2018 water quality standards. The process for updating the Bay Delta standards, which again will deal with necessary flows, um, for the Sacramento River um, is underway um, and uh, we're proceeding as a, uh, to uh, set standards which likely based on the scientific basis report uh, will require in-stream flows uh, on the Sacramento River um, and its tributaries. Uh, so at this point, um, I will turn it over to Sam uh, for his part of the presentation. Thanks, Andy. Uh, really fantastic presentation and a great window into the um, complicated uh, exigencies and, and uh, processes and tools by which the state um, aims to manage its water resources. Um, I think we can all appreciate uh, that the, it's becoming uh, an ever more difficult, challenging task. Um, as uh, the climate warms and we see the kinds of uh, you know more frequent and, and severe drought and other um, phenomena kind of related to the to the war to warming the warming climate. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I recognize uh, a number of folks who are on the call from our you know other um, things that we're collectively working on. So good to see everyone. Alex and I are going to talk about um, the California's 30 by 30 initiative and uh, what uh, we are doing to help the state uh, in particular through that initiative uh, better protect, uh, restore, uh, and manage its water, its freshwater resources. Um, Alex is going to manage the slide deck for us and and uh, and we'll come on and talk uh, here in a few minutes. But anyway, I, I think probably most everyone, if not all of you on the call are familiar with the state's 30 by 30 uh, initiative. It was, it's uh, the uh, follow through from Governor Newsom's executive action of a couple of years ago, directing the state to uh take action to uh in accordance with recommendations number not too many years ago from a international body of ecologists and other scientists alarmed at the 
rate of loss of biodiversity across the world came up with essentially some recommendations for how much how much aquatic and terrestrial habitat we would need to protect we need to preserve or restore in order to stem that loss um, much less reverse it um the state has and now the nation have committed themselves to uh trying to achieve 30 per, a protection of 30 percent of our lands and waters by the year 2030. The state's initiative, uh, which is being directed by the California Natural Resources Agency, has really three uh, primary goals. The first is, is to protect the state's biodiversity. And California, as probably most of you know, is one of, is a is a global hotspot for biodiversity. It's by far the most biodiverse of any of the fifty states of 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 of, you, of America, and uh, and the Sierra is sort of a is a great poster child for the states. You know, a number of the states' endemic species that are either in decline or at risk um, as a result of. Uh, most recently, uh, probably in, in uh, loss intensified by the warming climate. So that's one leg of the, uh, that's one goal. The a second goal is to improve, uh, to boost the resilience of the landscape and of uh, human and wildlife and communities to the warming climate. Um, and the third goal is to uh, enhance and make more equitable access uh, of people to the outdoors. And so these these three objectives are are driving the state's process. Um, relatively quickly after the state began, the resources agency began its preparation of a formal uh, strategy document as to how the state was going to achieve 30 by 30. Uh, a number of folks interested who are working on these kinds of issues and who were interested in um, synergizing our efforts to help the state actually achieve this, this ambitious initiative. Uh, came together and into what's now uh, a formal coalition called the Power in Nature Coalition. Um, the, the coalition is largely organized by bioregion, consistent with the state's uh, concept framework for bioregion. Uh, there's a work group associated with the Sierra Nevada, one for the Central Coast, one for the far northern part of the state, et cetera. And um, and the uh, one one group one of the work groups relatively recent that's kind of evolved out of that effort is the is the group that that um, is co-managed by by me and Alex, which is specific to freshwater uh, resources. And the the uh, intent of this work group is to identify and. Uh, articulate um, and advocate for ways that the state can um, better elevate the importance of protecting and restoring freshwater resources in the 30 by 30 context. The uh, strategy report uh, that CNRA released uh, after a year of work uh, was surprisingly superficial in its treatment uh, in its consideration of the importance of fresh water, which after all is kind of the cornerstone of life. And, uh, and, and I think it was, uh, some of us think that it was to some extent, uh, not so much deliberate as just a reflection of the fact that it's, it's more difficult to to measure how you, uh, what success looks like in protecting water resources than it is 
uh, land like terrestrial resources where you can say, well, we protected this many acres of uh, or square miles of land or habitat, or we built this, uh, you know, this length of wildlife span over uh, over a you know interstate freeway or things like that. Um, but anyway, we're we're uh, uh, the freshwater work group now has uh, come up with some recommendations to the state uh, in the form of a letter that will be submitted shortly. We're we're actually um, uh, encouraging folks to take a look at it and and even join as a co-signer of the letter if uh, you know if it makes sense to you and there's a nexus to your work. Alex, maybe you can drop a link to that letter in the chat when you have a chance. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll let's let's dive into what that you know what we what we've come up with. So Alex, if you want to go to the next slide, we can look at that. So among uh, as I as I was saying earlier, one of the things that we've identified as 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 important for the state to do is to to better define the metrics for success specific to fresh water. Um, what does that look like? It, it, we could say it, it, in some it, it looks like uh wild and scenic river either federal or state wild and scenic river designations that's that's one thing it looks like it looks like um uh, it could look like uh minimum flow requirements that's uh although that's more that's as i'm sure everybody's aware uh, if not before at least after andy's presentation that's 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 very difficult um and it could also look like uh Create, it looks like to some extent the uh, the intention of the SGMA and you better restoring and utilizing groundwater basins for storage and uh, as part of our water infrastructure. Uh, but anyway, we we uh, that's that's one of our recommendations. Another is to is to get the state move the state off of this cycle of reaction reaction to drought like right now drought is generally treated on sort of an emergency basis instead of when we know that it's a, a fixture in california's mediterranean climate and that it's increasingly clear that the models are the accuracy of the models is is right we're we're going to see more frequent and severe droughts going you know forward and so we need to be better prepared for drought. What does that mean? So we can, you know, take action when we don't have a good water year so that we're not in, you know, crisis mode and trying to protect either ESA listed fish species or, you know, people's ability to utilize water for various things, at least on a minimum basis. Third, we're, uh, we're encouraging the state to identify uh, with our help and uh, and reconnect uh, watersheds that are overextended, overworked, um, and there are many in the state. Fourth, we're we've we've uh, this is kind of a no brainer, uh, but we've we, we think, but where there are dams that are no longer serving a useful purpose or have outlived their uh, their productivity uh, as for delivering hydropower or storage, such as the old San Clemente Dam on the, on the Carmel River, and that are losing money for the dam, the owners of the projects, we should take them out. Few actions have as much potential to reboot ecological productivity as taking out dams. Fourth, uh, better protect and restore headwaters and higher elevation meadows. So this is one of the ways that uh, CRNRA's primary strategy of that it's thus far sort of put into practice for achieving 30 by 30 is actually, you know, is actually done. We 
the, uh, the state's primary strategy thus far has been to push money out through grant making uh, through entities like the Wildlife Conservation Board or the Coastal Conservancy and entities like that into the hands of uh, more local or regional entities that can develop and manage restoration projects. Trout Unlimited is one of these entities. A number of folks on the call are also doing uh, this kind of work. Uh, we are doing it in uh, at scale in the Southern Sierra where we're working in Golden Trout Country to uh, restore meadows, which it turns out have very quite vital function hydrologically, uh, serving as sponges, which capture and slowly release water uh, and which are under increasing pressure as things get hotter and drier. Um, we're proposing to invest, that the state invest more in restoring urban streams, which also seems like a no brainer given the uh, multiple values associated with the, such streams and the high and the high potential of them for helping the state make it more accessible, more equitably access the uh, outdoor, you know, natural areas. Um, Alex, do you want to move to the next slide, please? So our letter reflects, as those of you who are familiar with it, seen that uh, we've gotten, uh, there's been a lot of input from uh, all the sort of various diverse uh, constituencies that are, that are contributing to the Power and Nature Coalition. Um, and one of the things that we feel strongly committed to is, is making sure that we're, uh, the state's um, improvements that the state makes in protecting and restoring and utilizing freshwater resources reflect uh, a com also a commitment to addressing historical legacy wrongs. Um, and so many of these, these final six, several of these final six recommendations address that particular kind of priority for us. Um, we've also, I think it's pretty well understood now that the application of traditional ecological knowledge as practiced by indigenous peoples uh, for thousands of years uh, before white settlement was is uh, one of the ways that we can help make the landscape more climate resilient. And uh, so we're encouraging the state in that regard. Um, we're, uh, and that includes uh, the application of traditional fire uh, management techniques to, to watersheds. Um, and lastly, we're, we're, uh, strongly encouraging the state to prioritize floodplain restoration, in particular around at-risk communities in the uh, greater Bay Delta and Southern San Joaquin Valley regions. And uh, as we've had various uh, kind of flood alerts and potential disastrous flooding uh, as the, uh, the this winter's near record snowpack has been melting, you know, that's sort of the importance of that has kind of come to the fore. Um, Alex, what did I miss? I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'll turn it over to you unless, uh, there's anything else. No, I, I think you covered cover. everything. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see if anything else comes up in the questions, but that was mm -hmm. great. Um, and hi, folks. My name is Alex Bloomer. I'm a consultant and environmental attorney. I've been working with the Power of Nature Coalition that Sam mentioned on 30, 30 efforts um, over the last year plus now, and also work with a number of clients on water conservation and habitat issues. I will say up front, everything I say here is just my own views, doesn't reflect anything that I, on the behalf of my clients, but, um, and Andy actually touched on a few of the um, 
the bills that I was going to highlight, but wanted to flag um, a couple of others. So SB 337 by Senator Min, who's the new chair of the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee, he introduced a bill that will now codify 30 by 30, as Sam mentioned. The start is an executive order, and it'll be great now to have the legislature kind of picking up the baton and showing leadership to help codify this. This will help get funding um, and get support for it beyond the Newsom administration. Um, in the next, we have the future administrations that we have yet to come. And I think there's already talk of, you know, what can we do past 2030? What more ambitious targets can we set? Um, as Andy mentioned, the Planning Conservation League, which has actually joined us on the call today, um, convened a number of water law attorneys and scholars to really dive into what's needed to modernize water rights and mo modernize water rights. And there are a number of bills that were introduced last year and this year that um, aim to do just that. Um, Andy mentioned both 1337 and 389. I'll also flag AB460 by Assembly Member Bauer Cahan, which would increase the fines that the state water board can impose upon water rights violators and authorizes the board to issue an interim relief order to halt unauthorized or harmful use of water resources. This is a direct result of a story that many of you may have heard of, but it was um, last year, water users on the Shasta were openly diverting waters and basically just saying that the $50 fine was the cost to doing business and they were going to keep doing it. So um, the assembly member who's the chair of the Water Parks and Wildlife Committee stepped in with AB 460 to really increase the fines, make it substantial enough to hopefully deter illegal behavior and give the board more authority um, to help enforce these, these laws, the existing laws that are already on the books. So for all three of these water rights bills, there's been broad support from environmental groups, environmental justice groups, drinking water advocates, and the tribes across California. Um, and not surprisingly, maybe some pushback from water agencies. There's been strong opposition to these bills. So they'll be going to the, um, the floor votes probably, you know, with either at the end of this week or, or next week, and we'll see if they survive and move over to the next house. Um, but there, it's definitely going to be a close call, I think, for, for all of these. It's been very controversial. Um, and for better or for worse, you know, I've sat through every committee that these bills have been heard in, and I think it's really helped bring these issues to the forefront for the legislature and get much more informed um, legislators. You know, we have a ton of new assembly members and senators in the building this year, and they've gone to get a, a deep dive on water rights and some of the historic inequities that are trying to be addressed. So I think that's been really beneficial. Um, I'll point out to at a very high level and welcome folks to reach out to me if they want more details. But in the last couple of weeks, um, there have been a number of trailer bills introduced by the Newsom administration. And Historically, trailer bills are supposed to kind of attach to a budget line item. There's money being spent. This is how it's being spent. Um, under the Newsom administration, I think there's been more efforts to do some pretty comprehensive policy changes through the trailer bill package. And there's been pushback from some of the environmental groups saying that these are huge changes to environmental laws. We should go through the policy process you know, such as going through all the policy committees, Assembly, Water Parks and Wildlife, the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee, and having a much more open and transparent stakeholder process and debate amongst the members. We'll see if these trailer bills make it over the finish line. They all need to be passed with the budget on June 15th. So they'll, there's potentially some huge changes that are coming. Um, along with the May revise, which was kind of the revised budget, and I'll get to that in a second, that was released a week and a half ago, there was a drought and flooding trailer bill that I'm just gonna give a very high level overview of this and again, welcome questions, but would exempt flood water capture from the stream bed alteration agreements, declares that storing water underground is a beneficial use and it would eliminate the provisions of existing law that forfeit ownership if the water is not beneficially used for five years. It would also allow for diversion of flood water without permits or water rights. It would exempt diversions of flood water for groundwater recharge from CEQA, and also another pretty broad sweeping CEQA exemption. It would exempt any actions of public agencies that were quote unquote related to the conservation of Colorado River water supplies. So there's been a number of environmental groups weighing in um, in opposition to these efforts. They think these, is, these are really significant policy changes that really deserve to be hashed out in policy committee. Um, 
and are nervous about the, the broad sweeping broad sweeping CEQA exemptions to, to say the least. Um, there was also just this last Friday, a pretty major package introduced um, all under the kind of infrastructure title, but um, touching on a whole number of things. And I, I will not get into the details, but just flag there will be um, changes to administrative records, CEQA judicial streamlining, accelerating environmental mitigation, um, and the fully protected species reclassification. Again, these are pretty substantial changes to environmental laws. There were 75 nonprofit environmental groups that signed on to a letter just over the weekend within a matter of days uh, pushing back on the Newsom administration for trying to enact such significant, substantial changes through the trailer bill process. The letter didn't get into the details of each of these trailer bills specifically. I think, you know, individual groups will probably be doing that in their own time. But um, just the process itself, I think, has, has arisen a lot of concerns. Um, Lastly, on the budget, um, this has been a really dire year. Last year, we had a huge surplus. There was you know, a ton of really ambitious spending targets put out last year. And this year, you know, we started 2023 in January with the budget predicting a $22.5 .2, billion deficit. By the May revise, which was released last Friday, it was looking more like 30. The Legislative Analyst Office is saying it's probably even more than that. But um, there have been really significant cuts to budget pieces. So again, just flagging some of the high level ones that I think would probably be most relevant to this group, but um, welcome questions in the Q&A. So the um, Wildlife Conservation Board, there's proposed in the January budget, there was proposed 239 million reduction in funding, which would include a near elimination of the watershed resilience programs for the Cascade and High Sierra region. Um, there was a $100 million reduction to the state conservancies, you know, as a whole, but that includes the Sierra Nevada and the Tahoe conservancies, and a significant reduction to funding capacity building and partnerships for the Climate Smart, Smart Lands Program, the Department of Conservation, and the Tribal Nature-Based Corps. Um, again, you know, this is still an open conversation. I think, you know, we'll know in the next month how this will all play out, but, um, there's a number of environmental groups pushing back on these significant cuts, a lot of them which will affect uh, 30 by 30 goals. In parallel to this, there's a bond effort as Newsom you know, framed his cuts in the May revise. He said a lot of them will be moved over to a bond effort. The Newsom administration itself has not come out with the exact number of what they envision the bond to be, but both the assembly and the Senate have introduced bonds. Um, numbers are here on the slide that are very ambitious, you know, probably around $15 billion and will include really significant spending for natural resources. So if your organization has not looked at the language of these bills, I encourage you to do so. There's going to be important stuff in there and de definitely weigh in with your priorities. Um, and I'll end it at that and we can go to Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and sharing such uh, relevant and timely information. You can see that there is contact information for Andy, Sam, and Alex on the slide here. Um, so you can take note of that to contact them um, if you have more questions too, but right now, um, we'll get into Q&A in just a moment. Um, I wanted to invite all of the attendees here today to contribute to Sierra Nevada Alliance to help keep these monthly webinars free and accessible to all, and also to support our efforts to protect the Sierra Nevada land, water, and wildlife. So you can visit sierranevadaalliance.org slash donate to help protect the Sierra now and for the future. And at this time, if anyone has any questions or comments for our panelists, you can add them to the chat. I will just wait a few moments here, um, give people a chance to put their feedback um, and their questions here in the chat. 
And I do have a couple questions here um, to start. So the first one is, does the bare minimum water level regulation work to keep fish populations alive and rebound? Thinking this one was for Andy. Yeah, the, the what we call belly scraping flows were basically to keep the fish alive during the drought. They were not intended to deal with the rebound and uh, certainly would not have done so. It's just to, in, in Deer Creek, the problem is the flows got so low, the fish couldn't migrate through to where uh, the cooler waters were available for spawning. We had to protect those minimum flows, which actually were not required year round. They were only during the migration period. So the fish could get up uh, and survive. And that's, that's a listed species. That one of the things we're looking at now is, and had been looking at for even before the drought, trying to set flow standards that would apply over a longer term basis uh, and adjust so there are high flows in wet years and and uh, survival flows in very dry years, um, because just doing the drought is enough to. It, it, we're just getting through the emergency. We're not trying to recover. Um, the Bay Delta plan, which I skipped over fairly quickly, that's part of its purpose. The flows are not high enough to protect the in-stream beneficial uses, and we need to set standards to protect those. There's some, there are other streams where we're trying to do the same thing as set some in-stream flow standards consistent what's necessary to protect the fishery and other in-stream beneficial uses. But these emergency regulations were just the bare minimum to get through the emergency. Right, we have another question here. Mr. Sawyer mentioned the Bay Delta plan process, but didn't mention the voluntary voluntary agreement process operating in parallel, if not ahead of the process. This includes the Tuolumne River voluntary agreements. Would he please comment on the voluntary agreements and the fact that the Tuolumne VA has an NOP out with comments due tomorrow to the water board? Um, the, we have a bit of a conundrum here where um, we were supposed to very promptly fully implement the Bay Delta standards for this, the tributaries to the Sacramento River, but have been San Joaquin River, but have been repeatedly uh, requested to delay uh, to allow the voluntary agreement process to proceed. We're also behind schedule on the Sacramento River again um, because of the uh, request to delay for the voluntary agreement process, among other things, including the complexity of the issues involved. So we've had a bit of a conundrum where the primary reason for the delay in setting Bell Delta out the standards and implementing them has been the voluntary agreements. And because the Bay Delta standing process, st standard process is delayed, there's less incentives for the voluntary agreements uh, to move forward. Uh, a voluntary agreement has been reached on the Tuolumne River. Uh, we're going to schedule proceedings to um, consider it. The governor's water uh, resilience portfolio uh, requires that for the voluntary agreements, there be uh, an environmental impact report prepared or that there be uh, a uh, scientific peer review, uh, and then it uh, has to meet water quality standards. Um, some people have hit on the idea that instead of making sure the voluntary agreements are consistent with the standards that have been set, we should modify the standards to conform to the voluntary agreements. And that may be the issue, I don't want to prejudge it, uh, in uh, connection with the Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement. Um, the, there are some fairly strict uh, state and federal law requirements when you uh, relax um, uh, water quality standards, and flow standards are water quality standards. Uh, so we will have to pay attention to those as part of the process, as well as make sure we have adequate environmental documentation and scientific peer review.
Um, given that other bonds, example, education and housing may be on the November ballot as well, do we think a climate bond has much of a chance? Whoops, has much of a chance for passing? Has there been any initial polling done yet? So who would like to answer that? I can, I can take that. Um, yes, there, there has been polling um, and I think the proponents of the bonds are definitely being mindful of the competing bonds. So the, at the earliest this bond would go to the voters in March of 2024, it would not be on, on this November's ballot. Um, and at the latest it would be November of 2024. But I think, yeah, part of that will just depend on both other bond efforts, and I think Howard Jarvis has a tax initiative that he's putting on the bond. So I think just being mindful of the bandwidth of the advocates <laughs> is part of this. But there has been polling, and it's been very strong. Um, I mean, it, from what I've seen, it's some of the strongest polling we've seen for climate funding um, over the years. And, you know, there's been this, this polling has been done, you know, year after year, and it seems just to be getting more and more support. So I think that that gives us some good optimism. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right, well, before you sign off, uh, Annika is going to drop a link for you all to provide feedback and evaluate today's presentation so we can provide the best content for you in the future. So check the chat, and um, if you could just take just a couple minutes, that would be really great. And um, I would love to thank Andy, Sam, and Alex for taking the time out of their busy schedules to share with our group today. Um, we will be sending out kind of a follow-up email with their contact information and also these resources that were dropped in the chat. So you can reach out to the panelists with questions or um, to us here at the Alliance if you have any other questions um, or comments about the topic today. And then last, I just wanted to invite you to, to attend our next webinar, which is on June 15th. We have Lucas Clay, who is a PhD candidate at Clemson University, and he will be presenting on forest carbon markets. So you can check SierraNevadaAlliance.org slash events to register. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day. And the someone asked where the recording will be available. You can go to our website, and there's a link for webinars and all of our past webinars. It'll be up within a week. So that's it. Thank you.